everyone. Um, how do I start this? So I'm Fazel. I'm from Broadcom. And I guess uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about SmartNix. And I'm assuming this is mostly a storage audience. So I was going to start by trying to tell you guys what, what is a SmartNix. <laughs> um, so the way I was going to sort of talk about what is a SmartNix, well, let's start with uh, what I do. I work for this part of Broadcom that designs NICs. So we have a whole product line from 1 gig Ethernet all the way to 200 gig Ethernet now. So we're in the NIC business. So that's, that's what I do. And what I've been working on for, I guess, more like almost like five years now is what happens after NICs and what do people want. And so we now have, when I started on this, the term smart NIC did not exist. Now everyone talks about smart NICs, at least in the networking side. So what I was going to do is give you a feel for what a smart NIC is, why we're doing it, what it is, how it's being used today, and then talk about what's going on in storage and where it fits in. So that's kind of uh, where, where I was going. Um, I have 50 minutes, and I'm a fast talker, and uh, I don't have 500 slides. So if there are questions, please. Please stop me and ask questions. I do better that way. So let's start with why is smart NIC? So the way, the way traditionally things have been is you, you, you basically connect a NIC inside of a server. And everything is done on the server. And all the, all the NIC has been viewed at is just a pipe out of that server to get something else. Yeah, it's got Ethernet. You can have InfiniBand. You can have all kinds of networking stuff, but it's a pipe out of the server. Well, what's been happening recently, and I think we're starting, we've been seeing, we started seeing this when I started on SmartNix, and now, now it's pretty clear that it's definitely happening, is that Moore's law is having an impact on the server. You know, if you look at the, if you look at the thing of doubling the CPU performance every two years, or every 18 months, or something of that range, that's not, that's not happening anymore because it's, it gets harder and harder as the geometries get smaller. So, so that's, that's the big thing that is, uh, that is, that is impacting that. Um, so the other thing that's, um, that is happening in as we get to small, people are putting a lot more cores inside of a server. But if you go and look at a server, you'll find out as you add more cores, those cores you add that are above and beyond kind of thing they're a lot more expensive than the, the initial one. You buy a 16-core server versus a, a 24-core server, it's not, it's not a, a linear change from 16 to 24 because the dies get bigger, it's, it's, hard, it, it's, not a, it's not a linear, it's not only a cost increase. So that's, that, people look at that when they deploy systems as to how many cores do I want, can I afford it? And the other thing you see in a, the traditional one new server that everyone ships is basically a dual socket server, right? You have two sockets in there, and, uh, and you connect it together by a bus that connects them, you know, QPI or whatever the latest name is of these buses. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an interconnect between the two that is basically for your cache coherency. And one of the things that you find out is that um, there are two things people are doing. is A lot of people don't use the second socket very much. They, they actually use it mostly as a memory as a memory expansion or adding more, more IOs, because if you look at the number of, of uh, PCIe lanes on one socket, it's limited, and the amount of memory on one socket is limited, so they, they use the second one as expansion. But also that you find out is that the, that uh, interconnect has a, has a performance uh, impact. So if you take an IO, it comes in from one socket, comes in from the network through one socket, you go through the QPI bus to the second socket has a different latency than you stay through that same socket. So for some storage where you care about, you care about tail latency, that makes, a, that makes a big difference. So these are the things architecturally that's happening from a, from a server perspective. But the other thing that we're seeing as far as, uh, as people are building, who are building clouds, whether you know, mostly the hyperscale guys, but also now with a lot of the private clouds where people want to build a pretty big infrastructure for their for their internal users. Um, you you want to build you know scale out kind of systems, and when you do storage and you do scale out systems, the full domain matters. 
You know, so how many, you know, how many uh, drives are behind a node, and, when it, and, and if that node fails, how much, how much of my data do I lose, and how do I replicate that? So these things all, all come along, and we've been trying to work on some of those problems. It's kind of what we've been working at in our, in our, in our group at Broadcom. So what we did was we looked at this whole thing, and we said, well, what do we do about making life easier for that, uh, making life easier for that CPU? What do we do about uh, you know, allowing people to build those scale-out systems. So we came out with is what people are now calling a smart NIC. So this is a picture of what we ship down the bottom. This is a, it's a half-length, half-high PCIe card. And instead of having just a, a NIC on there, it has a smart NIC, which from a board perspective, all that's different between it and a NIC is it does have memory on there. And the reason it has memory on there is that that smart NIC basically has embedded cores inside it. Our chip right now, this is, we call it Stingray. What it has inside it is it has uh, eight uh, ARM, 64-bit ARM cores, A72 cores, running at 3 gigahertz. So it's a pretty significant um, piece of uh, processor out there. And the nice thing about that, uh, that processor is we run Linux on there. So from a development, uh, software development perspective, that's no, no different than running a server. I mean, you can, you can get in there, you can SSH into that box, run it just the same as you run any server. But what it does is that it allows you to have data coming in from the network, run through those ARM cores, and then go out for the, to the PCIe bus to the host. So all traffic between the, the host and the... Uh, and this, the network can go for, those, for, those, uh, for that server. Think of it as a, an embedded server. So the, the thing that we show at the top is, is the kind of things that our customers are doing with the smart NICs. We, we, we have two, we see people doing what we call two, two kind of models of what they do with it. Uh, they, they run anything from networking services, storage services, compute services, but they do two things. They, they either offload things on the server. So if you look at things like in the networking side, the OVS, Open vSwitch. Open vSwitch is what you run in your hypervisor to manage your virtual, tra your virtual uh, network traffic and assign it to your VMs. So we can take that code directly from that, uh, from that server and push it down into, into this environment. And now what you do is you free up cores on the other side. And, and then on the other side, so that's what we call an, an, uh, an offload model. Then if you look at uh, from the, what we call the onload model, it's taking those appliances that you tend to have in the network. People put a lot of appliances in the network, the data center, you know, whether it's your firewalls, you know, intrusion detection. There's a lot of boxes out in that network. They, the challenge with those boxes, they're not very scalable. Uh, you buy a box, it has so many ports, it has so much performance, you want more, you buy another big expensive box. So the model that people are going to is this onload model, but rather than having, I give the firewall as an example because we have customers doing that, rather than having one big firewall box, you distribute your firewall across all the ports on all the, on all the servers. So there's localized uh, implementation of your firewall inside that, that NIC. And again, it's Linux, so you can, port, you can port that to it. So it allows people to build more scalable systems, and again, saves you, saves you a lot of, of, uh, of cost from things that you would deploy, deploy in, the, in the data center. And we are seeing use cases for for uh, storage on the, on the server side, the main one being, you know, most disaggregation, uh, disaggregated server kind of environment, uh, storage environments, you tend to have a client running on your server. So you can port that client to, to the smart NIC. So it sits between the network, run your client, you can do distributed RAID, that's one application people have. You run a RAID stack on there, you've got lots of boxes in your network, you, dis you, you allocate volumes on each box, and your RAID goes across the box. As any one box fails, you can rebuild your RAID from that for just for that server's uh, storage, not for the whole, well, not for everything else that's on the network. So, so again, when you do rebuilds, you've got to have a distributed rebuild because if there are 10 guys sharing one box, that one box buys, those 10 guys are each rebuilding their piece independently of each other. So, so, it, so it, it makes life a lot easier from a managing your storage kind of perspective. So we can see we, we have applications across. We, we, we even get people uh, who are 
running as a compute as a compute node inside of a, inside of another node. So you, you know, we, we run things like you know we run we run Linux, we run uh, we run uh, uh, Docker on there. So people port containers to the to the platform. We even had VMware port their ESXi hypervisor to to our smart thing. They did a demo of that at VMworld this year. And their, their basic idea is there's lots of applications there that are based around. VMware does not use Linux. They use ESXi as their development platform. So they say, oh, we can now port all our software to this kind of, what are we going to port? That's what they'll, they'll, I'm sure they're going to look at. So, so, so it, gives you, it gives you a feel. This, think of it as a server inside of a server with a network connectivity and a host connectivity. So SmartNix is a sort of a word. So, so the reason I wanted to show that is to give you where SmartNix are today. But, but I wanted to also say it's a word that has been used for quite a while, and, and it's very confusing. So SmartNix kind of have been evolved over time. And I think if you look at the first generations of what we call SmartNix was, was, what, was an FPGA. You basically had a card with an FPGA, you program the FPGA. People tend to, that was very focused on like telco guys were doing a lot of that. You could do a lot of packet processing in an FPGA. The problem with that is it's, it's really hard to program. Very few people can do that. You can't, you can't deploy that. Everyone can't deploy that. Now, you, you see some hyperscalers are deploying it at scale, but they're hyperscalers. They can do that. Everybody else, it's really hard to do that. Um, then there's a, another class of them that came up, which again is, is more focused on telcos I've been using a lot, is what they call, it's, an, it's a network processor. Very specialized instruction set, very hard to program, but very high performance. And uh, the model now that we're seeing for SmartNix, which is what we're focused on, and there's other people now starting to play, we, we see this as a class of devices that will be multi-vendor uh, kind of model, is give you a general purpose programming environment, which is Linux, uh, Linux is, is a great one, and, uh, but, but then give you accelerators to take advantage of. So for example, if you look at our SmartNIC, we put uh, encryption engines there. So you want to run SSL on the way in, you can run SSL on the way in. You want to run IPsec on the way in, you can run IPsec on the way in. You want to do uh, encryption of your drives from the server, even though the drives are on the network, as the IOs go for the, uh, go for the SmartNIC, we can encrypt the IO and ship it to the drives. It actually makes, uh, we're finding customers that find out that makes uh, managing, managing your keys a lot easier because you're not managing them on the storage box, you're managing them where the, let's, you know, you're, you're assigned a, a key to a VM, that, that's assigned to that VM. You move that VM around, you move the key with it. You don't have to worry about which box is that VM storage uh, data stored on when you're, when you're managing the keys. So, so we see encryption is a big thing, so we put an accelerator on there. So it gives you performance, and gives you low power at the same time. Now, a smart deck, like I showed you the picture, it does it does take more it does take more space and power. So it, it has there's a DDR there's DDR memory on the card. We ship cards with up to 16 gigabytes. We don't put we don't put hundreds of gigabytes on the card, but we put you know 16 gigabytes is is pretty pretty adequate for that kind of platform. So at the end of the day, it it all ends up on economics. You know, why, why would I do this? Does this save me money? And uh, if it doesn't save me money, why would I do it? I think uh, Stephen Bates this morning was talking about that during his computational storage talk, is people, look, people build spreadsheets and they look at what does it cost if I do it one way, what does it cost if I do it the other way? So this is like typically what we're seeing from, from discussions with customers is, is a lot of them are shipping these 36 cores servers with, you know, two, two, two dual socket servers. And uh, again, a lot of the time what's happening in that case is that that second socket is really used for memory expansion. So you've got, you got 18 cores that you're really using and uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's not highly, you know, that you're not using all the, the cores are highly inefficient, so you end up with 18 cores. And then, but out of that, you take cores out for the for for things like all your all your st storage services, networking services. You're doing encryption. You're doing storage services. You want to do a distributed RAID. You want to do all these things. They take up they take they take a bunch of the cores. 
So we, we done a lot of work on, on that kind of environment, how many calls does it take on the, on the server versus how many calls does it take on that. And, and these are kind of numbers we've, we've seen from customers when they, when they measure their, their CPU performance. So what we tell them basically is uh, those calls are now moved down. Uh, so this is, let's see, where am I? Yeah, so what, basically what you're seeing here is saying, okay, so, so you're, you're left with like, you know, anywhere between eight and 12 calls for your application when you take all these calls. Between utilization and what is used by the, by this, by the services, you're left, you're left with eight to 12 calls out of, out of your 36 calls. So then uh, what you're seeing now is that one of the things that people are doing, you know, there's a whole trend now to moving to those you know, single socket servers. So with a single socket server, I mean, the nice thing about the, the, the sort of new uh, you know, single socket service there, like what AMD has is, is you have a lot of memory on those things. They, they've actually increased the, uh, they've actually increased the, actually the number of memory channels on it. So you don't need that second socket for just storing memory. So you have one, one 18 core server. And if you put the smart NIC on there and you run all the services inside there, then that leaves you with the, that leaves you with with the calls for for running your applications or virtualization on there. So if you if you sort of walk through it, then at the end of the day you're left with anywhere from 16 to 18 calls, depending of what you do. One of the things that we're seeing that people are doing in this kind of environment is they're also doing what we call bare metal deployments, where they don't actually even run a hypervisor on the host. They can take all these services, run it in the smart NIC and totally decouple it from the server. The server doesn't even know there's a smart NIC there. And that allows you to get 100% utilization. The calls are all available. They're available to your application. That's bottom line is what it is. That's what the applications have is all the calls on there. So we see very high, very high availability of calls for, for the application if, we, if you put a smart NIC and you run in like a bare metal kind of, kind of mode. Okay, so, so then now let's talk about about uh, storage, because at the end, this is what we're here for. So this is kind of a picture of what we are, what we're seeing our customers doing. You know, we see we see them taking the, the smart NIC and doing things like RAID. You know, they, they do they do uh, bridging, right? And I'll talk to you about that a little bit. About you know, this ASCSI to NVMe is one of the ones, and I'll, and I'll have a, a bit more details on what we actually did what, with one customer on that one. And uh, and the beauty of of uh, of having a, a, a smart NIC like that, we can go out to the network and uh, you can go TCP, you can go Rocky, we do both, you can do both, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So you can plug one chip and, and have all of that in there and it's all totally offloaded and uh, off of there. And then the other side is one of the other use cases for a chip is on the target side. So we're getting a lot of people that are deploying these what we're calling smart buffs. You know, a smart JBOF basically is what that is. And what we do on there, we do the target side and we can run, we can run software on there that go between that and the, and, the storage, and the storage that's sitting on the back. And we're seeing everything from just you know, standard targets, which is just fabrics to the drives. We're also seeing people putting, putting applications on there like we have in-memory databases being ported to, to that. We have key value stores being ported to that. I'll show you some examples of of what, we'd, what our customers are doing with that. And um, so you see that now the smart NIC, it's, it's, a, it's your server with a smart NIC. On the target, what are, one of the things that we're seeing is that they put, they put the device, the, the, the Stingray device, but they also put a small number of drives behind it. As opposed to building a box with uh, 24 drives behind it, they tend to put somewhere between four and six drives behind that device. And the, the thinking on there, again, is back to that full, full domain kind of, uh, kind of thinking. And I'll give you a slide on that one. Um, because one of the challenges is that, you know, drives are getting, with SSDs, the, 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 the density of the drives are doubling very fast. I don't know what it is every year, every two years, or whatever it is. You know, Moore's law is working for, for SSDs. It may not be working for CPUs, it's working for SSDs. And so they look at the amount of drives that are sitting behind a box, and that, that's a big deal. So, so, so we did this experiment, 
This is an experiment we did with a customer who said, I wanted to go to that model of putting a small number of drives behind, behind, uh, behind the Stingray. But rather than uh, trying to match the performance of the dual socket x86 that they had before, they said, why don't I use multiple Stingrays to, to, to emulate the, the performance of one dual socket Xeon? So where they had a dual socket, this is a real customer's workload. It's a proprietary storage stack. It is not a, it's not a Broadcom test. And uh, it's not a Broadcom generated software. It's, it's a customer software. And what they did was they had software they were running on dual socket server. And they said, to replace that single dual socket server, let me replace it with four Stingrays. So they put four Stingrays in there. And instead of going by 100 gigs, they, went, they had 25 gig connectivity to that one. So the, the network bandwidth ended up being the same. We actually used, it says 425s here, but it was actually 125 gig port on each one of these guys. Okay, so, so if you look at the performance, we, from a read perspective, we got just about the same read performance across those four Stingrays as we did with the one, with one dual socket server. But what was very interesting was the two other metrics. So look at the tail latency. The tail latency was literally half of, the, of what you get in a dual socket server. Now we haven't done, they didn't do a very deep analysis on that, but, but the rationale we came up with was what that was is that the higher tail latency was because you were crossing the QPI bus between the two sockets. It made a big difference to the tail latency. We're really a single socket server. We have eight cores, they have one, one interconnect, a knock inside there, that's it. You know, it's a small device with an internal single, single, single interconnect, no, nothing going between two, two devices. So I think that's what helped with, the, with, the, lo, with lo, the lower tail latency. The other thing that was really interesting was uh, the, power, the power of the whole thing. Excluding the drives, this is just looking at the, process, the two processing complex. It was like, we're half the power of that for the same performance. So for guys that are deploying at scale, that's a big deal. What was the NIC you used on the socket? On the dual socket, it was a 100 gig NIC. Like a Mellanox NIC or a Broadcom? Mm -hmm. Or one of the or Broadcom. I can't remember which one. I think we did it with both, because they had both of them. But it, the NIC was a NIC. And they had the same, same power. Same power is what it is. This was a this was a this was a TCP. This was TCP. This is not this is not Rocky. This is TCP. But the storage protocol was not a standard storage protocol. They had their own their own stuff they were doing on there. And uh, so 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 the kind of reasoning behind behind the the power is because we if you look at at a device like a Stingray. It's a much more integrated device, okay? And we don't have, we don't, we don't, you know, we're not like, you look at your dual socket Xeon, these are huge, huge caches in there. Caches take a lot of, a lot of power. And, and also to build this, you know, we, we, we don't claim that our Stingray will run every application you, you run in a data center. But when it comes to applications like networking and storage, and things like that, I think we do, we, 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 we're more focused on that, but we have smaller caches, uh, everything's, uh, the, the, the NICs are integrated, integrating them makes a big deal in terms of both cost and, cost and power. On the, uh, on the socket, are you using the uh, vast uh, power-saving features, or you just have all the cores running? They were using all the cores on that, they were using all the cores on it, to get that, uh, to get that one point million hours, so we're using all the cores on the on that dual socket server. And I do not remember what the number of cores was on that one. But it was using all the cores on there because you, you're running IOs, you just you, they're, they're, they're turned on all the time. There is no there's no there's no you cut back you cut back performance. No, no, they're four separate nodes. They were four. No, there's no x86 in the Stingray one. So the Stingray one is this model, just this. One, one Stingray, 100 gigs. Well, there's, there's 425 gig ports in there. In this test, we only use 125 gig port. But there was, there's a smart NIC, 
with the four drives connected directly to it. So the SmartNIC, which I didn't, I should have done a block diagram of the SmartNIC. The SmartNIC is basically has Ethernet coming out on the on the network side, four ports of 25 gigs. On the PCIe uh, PCIe side, it has 16 lanes of PCIe coming out. When you plug it into a server, it looks like an endpoint. So you you go there, you discover a network device, uh, you, you discover a Broadcom NIC basically is what you see on, on that side. When you use it in the target mode, it's 16 lanes as a root complex. And you can divide them, you can keep them as 16 lanes, no, two by eights, uh, two by eights and uh, four by four or eight by twos. So in this configuration, we had them as uh, six, I think we had six devices, is that right? We had six devices with uh, by two, six by twos, so M.2 devices. So at six M.2 devices connected directly to the Stingray. There's nothing else, no PCIe switch, nothing of that sort in, in that. that. That's the other thing you have when you build a dual socket one. You have a PCIe switch, you have a whole, there's a whole bunch of other things inside that system. For this, it was just that one card and the drives connected directly to it. Is that funny? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's this, that's the marketing summary. Um, better power, better performance, lower power, smaller fault domain. That's that's what we're seeing the interest in is, is that. And so we have worked with a bunch of guys on on building platforms that use that Stingray. This is on the target side. So starting with you know we have a box on the left is a WD box, the F3K. Uh, and then there's, there's, a, there's different, uh, different ODM boxes. The one that's really interesting is that Wistron uh, Lima box. The Lima box basically allows you to put your 24 drives in it, has a PCIe switch fabric inside it, but you can plug six Stingrays inside it. So you could literally build a system where you assign four drives to each Stingray and six of these in parallel. You could, you could do all kinds of combination, but, but the one that... that I find the most interesting is plus six stingrays, put four drives to each, and you get that distributed kind of model that would just, or small node, because each, each one of those things just manages the four drives. Now, there are some common things that are, can fail, like the PCI switch is a common thing, but, but from, a, from a breaking it down, you can, you can break the performance down and, and uh, where one, one stingray just has to handle just four drives as opposed to having to, uh, to handle 24 drives. So that, and the, and the other nice thing about that kind of model, it doesn't push us to having to match with one chip the performance of an x86, because we, we're not going to compete. We're, we're about low power, low power, very dense kind of thing. So put, put more of these in a, in a chassis rather than putting, than putting, uh, putting one big CPU in there. That's, that's kind of our model. So just to show you some of the sort of use cases of those, of those smart NICs, and then uh, I'll show you one is, we actually had people, port, we, ported, we worked with Redis to put Redis Edge to this. It's a key value store. Very, very interesting on the, in, in the edge deployments because this is a very low power environment. You don't, you're not putting a, a, an x86 out there. This is, a 40, this is a 35 watt power envelope and you're running, you're running uh, and in memory database key value store in, in your in your edge. So that's that's an interest that's one that was a lot of interest in, in, in doing that. So what I was going to talk to you next about is is about uh, how the smart nick helps with NVMe over fabrics and what we're doing on that one. So so one of the things, I mean, the people here who've, who've been at it longer than I have on, in terms of developing the NVMe Fabrics standard, but, you know, we've been working on it since before 2016 when the standard came out. And if you look at it today, there's a lot of people out there supporting NVMe Fabrics, you know, from anywhere from system vendors uh, to the chip guys like us, to the ODMs, to the software guys. There's a lot of people in that space right now. And uh, so the standard's there, we know it's interoperable, we all go to UNH to do testing, and uh, that, all that's wonderful, but there's a problem. 
And the problem is, is support for in the, in the OS. Okay, I think that's, uh, that, that's a real issue what, that uh, customers are bringing up to us. And you know, it's, it's a challenge in the sense that if you, you can't, it's not, doesn't run, it, it's, it's, it's in recent uh, versions of Linux, but that's not as, as, as big a deal as you don't have it right now in, uh, in Windows. You know, that uh, Linux is pretty much what it is. VMware talks about having it, and that's going to be mostly be sometime in the next year. Or, I don't think they've announced time, but I think I know they're working on it, and they've, they started talking about it, but it's not there yet. So, so you're, you're, you're running Linux on your servers, that's great. You're running Windows, you have a problem. Okay. It's a fact. <laughs> that's a fact. So, so basically, it's broad adoption requires support across all platforms. It's kind of what the message that we are, we're, we're, we've, been, we've been given. So we, we started working with uh, pure storage. Okay, so pure storage has an all an, 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 uh, flash array that supports NVMe fabrics. NVMe fabric over Rocky is what they do. Um, pure storage also happens to have the fact that a lot of their customers are Windows Server customers. They run, uh, they run Windows servers, they run uh, uh, SQL is a big, big deployment, MySQL is what they do, that's, a lot, that's a, one of the big workloads. So these guys cannot get to, the, uh, cannot get to, to that. The reason they like that, uh, that all flash array from, uh, from Pure is the features in that all flash array. The big one that, that they, they're getting a lot of traction with is it, it, it does, it does uh, you can take a snapshot in the array and you can push that out to the cloud, you can push that to off-prem, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. And that's a big feature for them. And, uh, and the customers that are, those Windows customers can't take advantage of that. So, so they came to us and said, well, what, what, what can we do? So we gave them a two-step solution, right? And we gave them a two-step solution and the first one, which is, we actually showed this at, uh, we showed this at Pew Accelerate last week, the week before last, very recently. Um, what we did for them is we took that Stingray uh, chip that we have today, the, the card that we have, the, 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 that, that, that I showed you earlier on, and it's an Ethernet, it looks like an Ethernet device to the host. So what we did on there is we basically made it look like an Ethernet device, the server that was running Windows Server uh, basically used an iSCSI initiator. Then as, a, as the iSCSI traffic went through the Stingray, we mapped that to Fabrics. We took the IQN coming out from the iSCSI, we mapped it to an NQN on the NVMe side, on the NVMe Fabric side, and that server never knew it's connected to, it's connected to, to NVMe or Fabrics. It just thinks it's, it's, it's connected to, to an iSCSI network. And then on the other side, the, 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 uh, the pure array ran standard, the standard NVMe of fabrics. So doing that, we were able to show, we were able to show that uh, uh, you can actually do that. You can connect a, a Windows server to, to, uh, to an NVMe of fabrics uh, or flash array. Now, what we're doing next is, uh, so that was first step. So we did that, we did that demo. Uh, at, uh, last, I think it was last week, I can't remember. I was there, but I don't remember. And now what we're gonna do is we have another device coming out, which is, which is a Stingray with an NVMe interface on top of it. So rather than coming, talking to it as, a, as a, an Ethernet device, you talk to it as, a, as an NVMe device. So when you boot up your server, you look at it, you see an SSD, but it says Broadcom on it. And Broadcom does not ship SSDs. We have no, we have no plans, for, well, I, I, not that I know of, but I, I do not know of any Broadcom SSDs. So we're not in the SSD business, but it looks like a Broadcom SSD. So now what, what that allows us to do is, instead of just, is to be into an EOS. And what our goal with that is, so the ASCSI was nice. It allowed, it, sh it, showed, our cust it showed the Pure's customers that there was a way out of, uh, of where they were at, that they were, they were not stranded. But, but NVMe is a much better solution because the host, you know, SCSI is, it's pretty, 
post-intensive from a CPU utilization point of view. NVMe is a much, much lighter, easier to use kind of interface. So, so where we're going next is we, we have this, this uh, what we call Glass Creek, and I'll show you what that is, it, which, which will allow us to go to NVMe instead of staying with, uh, instead of staying with ASCSI. So that's the marketing slides. Uh, what did we say? So we, yeah, so now with Windows, basically some rather just said we were, we were able to get, uh, to get a Windows server talking to a, to an, uh, a Rocky, an NVMe over Rocky, over Rocky uh, uh, flash array. So, just to finish, this is, this is basically what the, so, so this is a product that we have in development right now, we, we are, we're starting to ship to early, early, early developer customers uh, right now. But basically, it's the same, it's a Stingray device with an NVMe interface. And uh, so all the things you can do on the Stingray, you can now do on that. So we're not targeting, so one of the easy use cases is actually, is just look like any device and go to fabrics. But there's more you can do with it. You could, you could put your client on there, and you can do things like distributed RAID, you can do encryption, you can do all that on the client side. That's, so, so if you want to make sure your data is protected as go across the network, you can do block encryption right there on the client side and, and do that. And it has no impact on your host, on your host interface. We had a, I think there was a discussion this morning uh, about NVMe over TCP, and, and I think uh, Intel talked about the, pole mode kind of stuff, or how do you get performance out of NVTCP? So one of the challenges when you start doing things like trying to run a pole mode driver on your server, it has an impact on your server. So yes, you can get higher performance, but there's a price to be paid for it. So what, we, what our model is that if you want to do all this stuff, like for example, you, wanted to, you want to run NVMe with TCP, and you want to get high performance, so you want the, the initiator to be, to be running in a pole mode mode, you can run that, that initiator on this chip. The server is not aware of that. It, looks, it sees an NVMe device. It has not, you don't have to worry that there's an impact to your host, uh, your host uh, kernel because you're trying to run in pole mode on there. So you, your server can be deterministic and all the offload of, of things that are DPDK, SPDK, pole mode kind of stuff can be done inside that. We have customers who are now taking their client software which they have a challenge that because a lot of these guys to get performance on their client software, they're doing like distributed RAID. They want to run in DP, they are running DPDK to do distributed RAID. And they, 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 then they go and put that on their clients, on their customer's uh, server, and then the customer says, what's going on? I, I see all this weird behavior. So if they put that same DPDK-based stuff, get performance by running it on the Stingray, the, 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 the host is not aware of it, the, the behavior of the host is more deterministic. That's a big deal. We see, that, we see a lot of interest in, in doing that. So we're working with people to, to port that. Again, that's a, we've announced this, year, we, we, this, this, this board. We have it. We have it. We're working with some early guys on, on, uh, on porting software to it. So hopefully next time I'm here, we'll have some real examples of what we've done with it. So that was it. This is just the standard summary that the marketing guys gave me. I, I don't even know what it says. <laughs> That's it. So I have one question on the couple of numbers you have, the, the estimate and the cost. Uh, I think maybe you could like... Yeah, like, yeah. So what's the level of bandwidth and the storage you are bandwidth you use to estimate the level of cost? With this, this is the, uh, the four versus this. That was not a storage, that was not, this is not a... So this was for someone who was running, like they were doing a virtualized networking. This, yeah. This, this one, right? No, there's one, yeah. So that came from a, that came from a customer. That came from a customer that basically was, was evaluating a smart NIC. So I do not know their workload. This was a big guy that... The, the, what the, the numbers came, we are using 
we have, we have a dual socket server. This is how many servers we're using right now. And this is what, this is how many, because they, they did the measurement on there. So I do not have the numbers on what they actually are. The, the, NIC, the NIC was uh, a 50 gig NIC, 50 gig NIC. Most of these guys have moved to 25, 50 gig uh, networking. It was not 100 gigs, and it was not 10 gigs. So this number is high. What's that? So the number of calls here is high. It's actually very high for 50 gigs. The number of calls being used by, uh, you see lower numbers? Yeah, you see lower numbers. Okay, so your software is more efficient than theirs. I can't, I can't tell you what the number, I can't tell you what the code looks like. I know that they were running, uh, they were running uh, a vSwitch on there and I know they had a, a, a storage client running on their server. And the numbers were their benchmarks, not, our, not ours, I have not. We have not, rep, we, have, we didn't try, because the problem we have is we replicated, it, it's, as you say, it's what, what's the workload? So I'm, I'll give you an example of what a customer gave us as numbers. So that came from an estimate of uh, what a dual socket costs and that the, that the approximate cost of a single socket is about half of that. So if you, so the memory, yeah, the memory would be high on this one is what you're saying, right? Mm-hmm. So the assumption here was that you're using like, a, like an EPIC chip that has more memory channels. So, so a lot of these guys will go into a dual socket server not because they needed more cores, because they needed the memory. A yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit, it's, a, it's really hard to, to go through do apples to total apples comparison. But we're seeing a lot of this now where people are going to a single socket server, because they say, the big thing that I think like Epic has done is that uh, they have more, memory. they did two things. They did two things that I think the customers really like, is one, they have more memory channels and they have more PCIe lanes. So especially you see them making a lot of traction on this uh, on the storage server side, because with all the, uh, I can build my 24 drive storage server and I can have a lot of memory bandwidth. Oh, you can? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll give that feedback. What's that? Yeah, now you get, you get me in trouble. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I'm not allowed to quote prices. Actually, you can, uh, you can go on the web and, and buy one for single unit prices. The single unit price is about $1,000. That is not, that is for a onesie price. That is not a, that's not if, you, if you're going to deploy, just, you can take the math from there. Yes, sir. No, so, so we do two things on the packet processing side. So we see a lot of customers that are doing, I mean, when you do packet processing, I mean, you run some of the uh, uh, packet processing kind of applications. If you run it on the host, what you tend to have is a lot of context switches as the packets come in. So, so if you just, so you have two things you can do on, on, a, on our smart NIC. You can run it, all the traffic can go through the ARM cores and, uh, and you get the performance of the ARM cores. Eight cores running at, uh, 
at, at three gigahertz is what you get out there. It does not, so that saves you right there all that context switching that you get on your, on your host. On top of that, to get higher performance inside the SmartNIC, we have an engine inside of the, the NIC that is inside the SmartNIC. It has an engine we call TrueFlow. TrueFlow is a packet processing engine. So you, now you can't do everything you want to do, but there's a lot of things you can do inside of a packet processor like that that will give you even higher performance. Give you an example. So people that want to do, in the networking side, that want to do um, virtual networking. Virtual networking is about, there's a packet with a, that's been, in, the, 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 the VMs, are, well, the VMCs is encapsulated in a packet that goes out on the network. So we can do all the NCAP, DCAP, and take that header and map it to the right VM and do SIOV into that VM, do all that stuff in that hardware engine. So, so the combination of, of yeah, full flexibility in the, in the ARM cores and you have even higher performance if you can take advantage of that. But the total benefit at the end of the day, all that happens without, without you getting a packet, packet hit on your, on your For the, for the accelerator, is that five minutes? I got five minutes. Um, for the accelerator, yes, we have, we have an API for how you, how you use the, the, the accelerator. For the ARM cores, standard Linux. So if you want to do it on the ARM cores, standard Linux. For the, uh, for the accelerator, there's an API for it.